the Bible? Do you read it? Do you cherish it? Do you hide it in your heart? Is it a consistent part of your journey? Or does it sit and collect dust? Do you apply it to your whole life? Or just listen to the parts that are convenient for you? Does it matter to you? Truly? Deeply? Matter? The Bible is God's word to his people. It's the blueprint by which we walk this life. It's comfort in times of need and clarity in times of confusion. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It's wisdom when there's confusion and certainty when there's doubt. It's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Bible. Do you read it? Good morning. Let's stand up and we're going to warm up our pipes a little. In his presence, there is comfort. In his presence. Good morning. We're glad you're here. <clears throat> Thank you for that song. Really enjoy the song before the message, In His Presence. We are all month long talking about God's Word and putting it in our heart and all the, all the different forms that we've talked about, reading it, hearing it studying it, meditating on it, memorizing it, obeying it. Remember the hand illustration from a couple weeks ago? Obeying in the hand. Good. Well, today we would like to continue. I found the book, the, the second part of... Two weeks ago we were in Kings, but this is the second side of it, so Second Chronicles... If you'll turn in your Bibles there to 2 Chronicles chapter 34. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 103, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. How many of you like honey? Not very many. <clears throat> oh, more. Okay, here, now here they come out of the woodwork. Okay, 
My dad loves honey. His favorite honey is orange blossom honey. He says he can taste the difference. I don't know. He loves it. I have a couple heads shaking, but anyways. Uh, obviously, we don't get orange blossom honey in Wyoming. You have to go where the orange trees are to get the orange blossom honey. But apparently, it is the best honey that there is. But can you imagine... How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Uh, Just a little backdrop again of where we're at. Our king, Josiah, was a good king. He became king at eight years old, remember that? His dad was a terrible king. His grandfather was not a good king. At the end of his life, though, he repented. For the last few years of his life, he repented. And he did what he could. But overall, the Bible records that he was not a good king. Now, his great-grandfather's name was Hezekiah. So that was uh, three generations. Was a good king. They said that both... Both uh, Manasseh and Ammon, the Bible says, did evil in the sight of the Lord. <clears throat> Hezekiah did, the Bible said, what was right or what was good in the sight of the Lord. So 86 years here between Hezekiah and Josiah. 86 years, three generations. Imagine what can happen just in one generation, two generations, three generations. How many of you uh, started something new at the beginning of the year? Anyone? Yay, there's a couple of us, right? Uh, A lot of people say, I'm not going to do a New Year's resolution, right? They don't like that term because uh, resolutions, a lot of times, what do we know about them? They get broke. Thank you. That was very helpful for you to say that. Yes, most of them get broken. How often and how quickly do they normally get broken? Do we know? A few days, someone, I think I heard hours, I don't know. It was weeks, right? How long does it take for a habit to get formed in our life? Easy to, how much? Someone said two months? Two. Wow, who said that? 21 days, yeah, that. That's, uh, that actually was a lot of the data until recently, it's 21 days. I think more and more people are saying maybe two months now to form a habit, but yeah, at least 21 days, thank you. So a lot of times our best intentions are derailed by what? One missed day, two missed days, a missed something. I broke down and ate Chick-fil-A, you know. Or, you know, ice cream is really good. It's really hard, right? (laughs) When we're trying to lose weight. So this is uh, healthy eating plans or exercise plans. You know, these things get broken by a day here and a day there. And it's hard to get back on track, right? Which is why that the, the Bible reading plan that we're working towards says, look, don't be discouraged. If you get off one day, just start the next day. Okay, don't. Don't get so hard on yourself. It's better to start back than to get so discouraged after missing a day or two. Anyways, so it's tempting to solely apply the truths of this biblical account to what we see in our own country. Do we, see, do we all see this in America? But when we read this passage, I think about myself. I recall um, goals or resolutions or whatever that that have been broken. We run the risk of slowly falling away until we are no better than the Israelites. Now we're talking about reading our Bibles again, right? We're no better. <clears throat> so it comes to the point where they didn't even know, like even the priests didn't know where the copy of the law was. What a sad, sad state, 86 years. 86 years it took, but here we are, Second Chronicles, sad state of affair. The priests who were supposed to be teaching the law 
didn't know where the law was, right? And we, and we talked the last time, and we talked about them finding the book. I found the book, right? Since you guys are all there, I'll get myself there. Okay. Second Chronicles chapter 34. So, what things in my life, what things are keeping me from God's word? What is it when we lose track? We need help getting back on track. But what is it that gets us a day behind, the busyness of our life, or things that don't really matter, like we talked about before? What can we do to help us to stay in God's word? We need his word that's sweeter than honey to our mouth. Does it taste when we read? Do we taste spiritually the food that God gives us in his word? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for you. We thank you that your living word, we have a copy of it. And we can read it and study it and meditate on it, memorize it, obey it. Help us to follow wholly after you. May we have an insatiable desire to know you and to know your word. May your Holy Spirit dwell in us richly. May we say yes to whatever you would have us say today in your name. Amen. Have you ever lost something valuable? Okay, now I've asked probably 20 people if they have an air tag today, and I, not one person has one. Just, okay, what are you have one? Moira has one. Who else has an air tag? Raise your hand. Two. Okay. You have one. Great. This is fantastic. We found people with air tags. What are the, I mean, what's the, is there a better word for them? Tracking device. Tracking, okay, then we got another hand. Oh, I'm so glad. There's a few people that have them. What do, what do we put them on, the people that have these things? Your phone. Key, okay, keys. Right? I, I lost my keys this week. I really did. You know where they were? I don't like things in my pockets when I'm up here speaking. They're on the desk in here, and, you know, I went home without them. So, keys, phone. Someone said phone. You lost your husband? Oh, no. <laughs> That's not good. Pat said that. <laughs> Someone's trying to lose their husband. I don't know about that. <laughs> what else? Phone, keys, wallet. I lose this occasionally. Wallet, right? We, we tend to lose things. My, what, I, I missed it. Your mind. I, I lose that every day. Okay, so what is, what is it that's valuable that we have? That we lose things, right? It's just occasionally what we do. But we have, to, we have to find it back. So what does it take? What kind of tracking device do we need in our lives? <clears throat> uh, we talked about three questions. You know, have we found the book? What are we doing with it, and are we sharing it? Today, to continue this, we want to look at five things very quickly. And let's look in our text. Verse 19, And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the law, that he rent his clothes, tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah and Hakam, the son of Shaphan, and Abdon, this is why in the soap thing we just skip right through these. Okay, let's go to 21. Go inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. So we just talked about the history. His dad and grandpa didn't do what they were supposed to do. <clears throat> they found the book, and now what are they going to do with it? He immediately, he has been a good king. He was a king at eight years old, right? And then at 16, he started tearing down idols, and he went from Jerusalem to all the areas around him, to all the borders, tearing down all the idols. It says he ground them into powder and put them on the, on the graves of people that disobeyed. Can you imagine the, what was going on here? Like, he wanted to eliminate this evil from the entire kingdom. As a young man, this happened. 
That's why these teenagers that are here, you can, you can do it. You can be an example right now in our own town and in your own school. God can use you and he wants to use you. Okay, let's skip down to verse 27 for sake of time. So he inquired of the Lord. He inquired of a prophetess. What's going to be done because of the evil of my father and my grandfather? What, what's going to happen to the nation of Israel? The answer was not good. The answer was, you're still going to be destroyed. But what can, what can he do? So this is what I want to get to. Number one, he humbled himself. He humbled himself. Verse 27. Because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God, when thou heardest the words of this, against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, and humblest thyself before me, and didst rend thy clothes, and weep before me, I have even heard thee also, saith the Lord. So what did he do? It's one thing to, to humble yourself. It's an entirely other, other thing to be humbled by someone else. Do you see the difference? Have you ever been humbled? Because I've been humbled many times, <clears throat> and rightly so. It's much better to humble yourself than to have someone humble you. So what did he do? He said, he agreed with God and humbled himself. He rent his clothes, a sign of repentance, and said, I'm sorry for what my father and grandfather have done, but I want to do what's right here with the book of the law that we have found. He humbled himself. Philippians 2.8 says, And being found in appearance as a man, Jesus Christ, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He humbled himself to his own Father's will and took our punishment in our place. He humbled himself. At the end of verse 27, he says, I have even heard thee also, saith the Lord. So listen, this is God saying, I have heard your cry and your humility, and behold, verse 28, I will gather thee to thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place and upon the inhabitants of the same. So they brought the king word again. What happened? Number two, God heard him and delayed judgment on them. Can you imagine God delaying judgment because of the faithfulness of a man? This is what happened here. When we are faithful to him, we can delay. There's a remnant left. We're the remnant. What are we doing to delay the judgment on our own land? What can we do? First, Second Peter 3, 8 and 9. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing. One thing. That with the Lord one day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness. But is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God heard him and delayed the judgment. What, did, what also did they do? He read the word of God. Now, he'd already read the word of God and had it read to him. Remember? Let's continue on. Verse 29. Then the king sent and gathered together all the elders of Judah in Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests, and the Levites, and all the people, great and small, and he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. Number three, he read God's word. He could have had the priest read it. He could have had the scribes read it. He could have had his, any one of his people that served under him read the book. What did he do? He, as the leader, made it personal. He read aloud. 
to everyone else. He assembled the whole country, basically. It says both great and small. Anyone, come to the temple, and I'm going to read God's word to you. Romans 15, 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. He could give them hope, right? The prophetess had just told him, you're not going to die. We're, uh, the destruction is going to be delayed. But we still need to be found faithful with what we've been given. So he read God's word, and the Bible says he stayed the course. He stayed the course. He could have said, well, the promise has been given. We're not going to be destroyed. What did he do? He put the pedal to the metal and kept going further. And the king, verse 31, And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant which are written in this book. He stayed the course. He didn't let up. He kept going. He stayed the course. Philippians 3, 12 but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Jesus Christ has also laid hold of me, as he laid hold of you. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I pressed toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I always think of a race when I read this verse or an athlete, or a wrestler, or some sort of, maybe some uh, rodeo race, horse race. I press toward the mark. What are we pressing for? Press toward the mark. It's not easy in the middle of the race when you're running a long distance to keep going. But you keep going, right? You learn to go through it. We are in this race called life, and it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. What are we, where are we at in the middle of the race? I love Jeff's testimony. He's, he said, I still have 20 years or more, probably more. I want to run this race, right? I think he said, I'm rounding third, and I want to go strong towards home. Wherever we're at in the race, you might be on just hitting the ball, headed towards first, on the uh, sports analogy, right? Wherever we're at, where are we pressing forward? So, not only did he stay the course, this is very interesting. Others stood with him. Verse 32, and he caused all that were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand to it. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. And Josiah took away all the abominations out of the countries that pertained to the children of Israel. He got rid of everything. All the idols, all the false idols. Well, there's only one true God. <clears throat> and made all that were present in Israel to serve, even to serve the Lord their God. And all his days were departed not from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. Others stood with him. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.2 says this, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. It's not just about me. It's not just about you. What are we doing to teach others also? Others stood with him. It... It may seem incredible that the priests <clears throat> were trying to worship God and didn't even have a copy of the law. Is that incredible? I mean, is that really, it's really hard for my mind to think about. How were they doing what they were supposed to be doing when they didn't even have the book of the law? When the book of the law was brought to King Josiah, he read it, he heard it, and he became distressed, didn't he? Because he's, he read what's going to happen if we don't obey this. And immediately, they wanted to obey again. Can you imagine staying, changing the time frame in God's mind and the destruction of Israel because of your obedience? 
He saw the need for a great restoration. We all need restored. And that need exists today as well. What will happen when we find, read, and apply the Word of God to our church today? Renovations can lead to some incredible discoveries. I have a few to give you. There was a Pennsylvania couple who tore out a wall. They were renovating their house. They found $200,000 of coins hidden away in a wall in their house that they had purchased. In 2006, a man tore down a false wall in his home and found an original painting by Norman Rockwell worth $5 million. Sometimes when we have restoration in our life, we have some amazing discoveries. The last one, in 1990, a woman was going through an attic in California and found an old trunk. Inside it was the missing handwritten manuscript of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Mark Twain's famous first novel published in 1884. How excited these people must be when they uncovered these treasures during their restoration projects, right? Jesus wants that. God wants that for us, for me, for you, for our church. He wants us to be restored to him wherever we're at, wherever we're at in this race of life, wherever we're at in our life. God, wants, God is in the restoration business, and there's some pretty good discoveries when he can restore us. Now, as we're doing through the month of January, we're going to have a testimony, and today, Carrie Lanning is going to come and give us a testimony of how God is using his devotional time, and when he's finished, he's going to lead us in a word of prayer. First of all, forgive me, because I'm going to be wandering I cannot stand in one spot. I had people tell me when I was working as an electrician, supervising men, that I wore them out when they used to watch me walk around. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Carrie Bodley Lanning. And the reason I share with you all three of my names excuse me, is a direct impact that my grandma Bodley had on my life. And when I was old enough to understand, she shared with me how I came about my three names. Of course, Lanning. But Carrie, C-A-R-E-Y. Like the avenue in Cheyenne if you want. But that's not where it came from, believe me. It came from the name of an English Baptist missionary in the 1700s who had a direct impact and influence on my grandma Bodley's life. And she impressed upon my mom and dad to name me Carrie Lanning. But that wasn't enough. My name is Carrie Bodley Lanning. My son Marshall, his middle name is Bodley. My grandson Nolan, one of his middle names is Bodley. And because of my grandma Bodley, and I knew when she used all three of my names, it was going to be for praise or instruction, and you might find this hard to believe, but a scolding. Ha-ha. My grandma impressed upon me at a very young age that in the Old Testament it says that God will never leave us or forsake us. I remember where she used to sit, right over there, when she was still able to come to church. And I would sit by my grandma. When she would share that Old Testament verse with me, it made an impression upon me. That's why I received Jesus as my Savior in this very church. 
I was baptized in that baptistry behind that wall at the age of nine. She had a direct input and an influence on my life. But we know as we get older, or at least I did, and as my dad would remind me later on, we become like we know everything. We can do everything without God's presence and role in our scripture reading and studying his word. As he stated, my dad, you became eight foot tall and bulletproof. And believe me, I thought I was. Later on in life, when I was going through a very, a very dark time, I remember those words that my grandma shared with me, that God will never leave you or forsake you. And that's when I came to Jesus and I asked for forgiveness. For He forgives our sins. And with for, not being forsaken also reminds me of love. And 1 John 4 it says, we love because God first loved us. As I fell on my knees before Jesus to ask for forgiveness, I felt the one thing I needed to do was start reading the Bible more. And I found an Our Daily Bread pamphlet where it leads you through the Bible in a yearly reading. And that was a good start. I will not ever deny the fact that it led me down a spiritual path that led me to where I am today. But there's more than that. And thankfully for this soap we have in our sanctuary, in our minds today. This daily reading in my journal that I write in is an incredible reminder of what God's scripture and word means to me and to you. What it can mean to you if you just apply it to your life. I know it's hard to read the Bible. And you get into the ones where someone begat someone and begat someone, and, and that gets a little intense. But as I started the SOAP program, when I'm reading in Genesis, from the beginning of man to the flood that Noah and his family went through, to Job where he lost everything, to Matthew where our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is born, it's an analogy of where our life can be from beginning to middle to end. The SOAP program is incredible. I do not, at this time, struggle to do it every day. I did it yesterday morning at 3 o'clock in the morning. Because yesterday... Yesterday I went to Sterling, Colorado and picked up my youngest daughter and we drove to Kearney, Nebraska to see my oldest daughter who'd been in a horrific car accident a little over two weeks ago. She's a miracle. She's a miracle. To see the pickup, and I seen the picture of the pickup yesterday and I told my daughter I don't ever want to see that picture again. To see what she went through and survive was a miracle. Luckily, when uh, she had her accident, there was a paramedic going home from work who seen the ending of the accident, and he come up on and couldn't get the pickup door open that she was driving her company pickup, and he seen her unconscious on the floorboard of the passenger side of the pickup. They have now determined that the wreck broke the seat belt she had on. He couldn't get her out, so he broke the window, and she became conscious, and the first thing she asked was, where is my dad? She asked me yesterday, where did that come from, dad? Why did I ask that? I said, honey, this is the reason I pray for you and all my kids and all my grandkids and all my family and all my extended family every day every day. Of course, that scared the paramedic because the first thing he said was, 
was there another person in the vehicle? And then she said, no, but I just felt my dad. I felt his presence with me. And you know what? Going through this soap program and writing in this journal every day, and the cover of the journal says, walk by faith, not by sight. Because I'm going through that, I continue to walk by faith and not by sight every day. And when I seen the miracle in my daughter's eyes yesterday, and we cried and we laughed and we giggled and we carried on like little kids. My grandma Bodley would have been proud of the fact that we have got to this point and we can only go further if we do the little things like this. It's a blessing to my life. It can be a blessing to your life if you just partake of it. Now I want to pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your son who gave everything on the cross for, for us, for all of mankind, for dying a horrible death, to be resurrected again, to prepare for us a place in heaven. I thank you, Lord, also for sparing my daughter's life and for being able to look in her eyes yesterday. I had to see her eyes. Not in a FaceTime photo, not in a conversation, but I had to look in her eyes and see her eyes and hear her giggle and see how she's doing because it meant the world to me. She's not my biological daughter, but I'm the only dad she has ever known. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for sparing her. Thank you, Lord, for being in our presence today. I praise you and thank you. And as we leave today, I pray that you will bless each and every one of us through the days and weeks ahead. And I ask these things in your precious name. Amen.